The Iliad by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler Book 14 Agamemnon proposes that the Achaeans should sail home, and is rebuked by Ulysses. Juno beguiles Jupiter. Hector is wounded. Nestor was sitting over his wine, but the cry of battle did not escape him, and he said to the son of Aesculapius, What, noble Machaean, is the meaning of all this? The shouts of men fighting by our ships grow stronger and stronger. Stay here, therefore, and sit over your wine, while fair Hecamede heats you a bath, and washes the clotted blood from off you. I will go at once to the lookout station and see what it is all about. As he spoke, he took up the shield of his son Thrasymedes, that was lying in his tent, all gleaming with bronze, for Thrasymedes had taken his father's shield. He grasped his redoubtable bronze-shod spear, and as soon as he was outside, saw the disastrous rout of the Achaean, who, now that their wall was overthrown, were flying pell-mell before the Trojans. As when there is a heavy swell upon the sea, but the waves are dumb, they keep their eyes on the watch for the quarter whence the fierce winds may spring upon them, but they stay where they are, and set neither this way nor that, till some particular wind sweeps down from heaven to determine them. Even so did the old man ponder whether to make for the crowd of Danians, or go in search of Agamemnon. In the end he deemed it best to go to the son of Atreus, but meanwhile the hosts were fighting and killing one another, and the hard bronze rattled on their bodies as they thrust at one another with their swords and spears. The wounded kings, the son of Tedius, Ulysses, and Agamemnon, son of Atreus, fell in with Nestor as they were coming up from their ships, for theirs were drawn up some way from where the fighting was going on, being on the shore itself, inasmuch as they had been beached first, while the wall had been built behind the hindermost. The stretch of the shore, wide though it was, did not afford room for all the ships, and the host was cramped for space. Therefore they had placed the ships in rows, one behind the other, and had filled the whole opening of the bay between the two points that formed it. The kings, leaning on their spears, were coming out to survey the fight, being in great anxiety, and when old Nestor met them they were filled with dismay. Then King Agamemnon said to him, Nestor, son of Neleus, honor to the Achaean name, why have you left the battle to come hither? I fear that what dread Hector said will come true, when he vaunted among the Trojans, saying that he would not return to Ilius till he had fired our ships and killed us. This is what he said, and now it is all coming true. Alas, others of the Achaeans, like Achilles, are in such anger with me that they refuse to fight by the sterns of our ships. Then Nestor, son of Gerene, answered, It is indeed as you say. It is all coming true at this moment, and even Jove, who thunders from on high, cannot prevent it. Fallen is the wall on which we relied as an impregnable bulwark, both for us and our fleet. The Trojans are fighting stubbornly and without seizing at the ships. Look where you may, you cannot see from what quarter the rout of the Achaeans is coming. They are being killed in a confused mass, and the battle cry ascends to heaven. Let us think, if counsel could be of any use, what we had better do. But I do not advise our going into battle ourselves, for a man cannot fight when he is wounded. And King Agamemnon answered, Nestor, if the Trojans are indeed fighting at the rear of our ships, and neither the wall nor the trench has served us, over which the Danians toiled so hard, and which they deemed would be an impregnable bulwark both for us and our fleet, I see it must be the will of Jove, that the Achaean should perish ingloriously here, far from Argos. I knew when Jove was willing to defend us, and I know now that he is raising the Trojans to light on, like honor with the gods, while us, on the other hand, he is bound hand and foot. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say. Let us bring down the ships that are on the beach, and draw them into the water. Let us make them fast to their mooring stones a little way out against the fall of night if even by night the Trojans will desist from fighting. 
we may then draw down the rest of the fleet. There's nothing wrong in flying ruin, even by night. It is better for a man that he should fly and be saved than be caught and killed. Ulysses looked fiercely at him and said, Son of Atreus, what are you talking about? Wretch! You should have commanded some other and baser army, and not been ruler over us, to whom Jove has allotted a life of hard fighting from youth to old age, till we every one of us perish. Is it thus that you would quit the city of Troy, to win which we have suffered so much hardship? Hold your peace, lest some other of the Achaeans hear you say what no man who knows how to give good counsel, no king over so great a host as that of the Argives, should ever have let fall from his lips. I despise your judgment utterly for what you have been saying. Would you, then, have us draw down our ships into the water while the battle is raging, and thus play further into the hands of the conquering Trojans? It would be ruin. The Achaeans will not go on fighting when they see the ships being drawn into the water, but will cease attacking and keep turning their eyes toward them. Your counsel, therefore, Sir Captain, would be our destruction. Agamemnon answered, Ulysses, your rebuke has stung me to the heart. I am not, however, ordering the Achaeans to draw their ships into the sea, whether they will or no. Someone, it may be, old or young, can offer us better counsel, which I shall rejoice to hear. Then said Diamond, such a one is at hand. He is not far to seek, if you will listen to me, and not resent my speaking, though I am younger than any of you. I am by lineage son to a noble sire, Tedius, who lies buried at Thebes. For Portheus had three noble sons, two of whom, Agrius and Melus, abode in Pluron and rocky Caledon. The third was the knight Oeneus, my father's father, and he was the most valiant of them all. Oeneus remained in his own country, but my father, as Jove and the other gods ordained it, migrated to Argus. He married into the family of Adrastus, and his house was one of great abundance, for he had large estates of rich corn-growing land, with much orchard ground as well, and he had many sheep. Moreover, he excelled all the Argives in the use of the spear. You must yourselves have heard whether these things are true or no. Therefore, when I say, well, despise not my words, as though I were a coward or of ignoble birth, I say then, let us go to the fight as we needs must, wounded though we be. When there, we may keep out of the battle and beyond the range of the spears, lest we get fresh wounds in addition to what we have already. But we can spur on others who have been indulging their spleen and holding aloof from battle hitherto. Thus did he speak, whereon they did even as he had said, and set out, King Agamemnon leading the way. Meanwhile Neptune had kept no blind lookout, and came up to them in the semblance of an old man. He took Agamemnon's right hand in his own, and said, Son of Atreus, I take it Achilles is glad now that he sees the Achaeans routed and slain, for he is utterly without remorse. May he come to a bad end, and heaven confound him! As for yourself, the blessed gods are not yet so bitterly angry with you, but that the princes and counselors of the Trojans shall again raise the dust upon the plain, and you shall see them flying from the ships and tents toward their city. With this he raised a mighty cry of battle, and sped forward to the plain. The voice that came from his deep chest was as that of nine or ten thousand men, when they are shouting in the thick of a fight, and it put fresh courage into the hearts of the Achaeans to wage war and do battle without ceasing. Juno of the Golden Throne looked down as she stood upon a peak of Olympus, and her heart was gladdened at the sight of him who was at once her brother and brother-in-law, hurrying hither and thither amid the fighting. Then she turned her eyes to Jove, as he sat on the topmost crests of many fountained Ida, and loathed him. She set herself to think how she might hoodwink him, and in the end she deemed that it would be best for her to go to Ida 
and array herself in rich attire in the hope that Jove might become enamored of her and wish to embrace her. While he was thus engaged, a sweet and careless sleep might be made to steal over his eyes and senses. She went, therefore, to the room which her son Vulcan had made her, and the doors of which he had cunningly fastened by means of a secret key so that no other god could open them. Here she entered and closed the doors behind her. She cleansed all the dirt from her fair body with ambrosia. Then she anointed herself with olive oil, ambrosial, very soft, and scented specially for herself. If it were so much as shaken in the bronze-floored house of Jove, the scent pervaded the universe of heaven and earth. With this she anointed her delicate skin, and then she plaited the fair ambrosial locks that flowed in a stream of golden tresses from her immortal head. She put on the wondrous robe which Minerva had worked for her with consummate art, and it embroidered with manifold devices. She fastened it about her bosom with golden clasps, and she girded herself with a girdle that had a hundred tassels. Then she fastened her earrings, three brilliant pendants that glistened most beautifully through the pierced lobes of her ears, and threw a lovely new veil over her head. She bound her sandals onto her feet, and when she had arrayed herself perfectly to her satisfaction, she left her room and called Venus to come aside and speak to her. My dear child, said she, will you do what I am going to ask of you, or will refuse me because you are angry at my being on the Danian side while you are on the Trojan? Jove's daughter Venus answered, Juno, august queen of goddesses, daughter of mighty Saturn, say what you want, and I will do it for you at once, if I can, and if it can be done at all. Then Juno told her a lying tale and said, I want you to endow me with some of those fascinating charms, the spells of which bring all things mortal and immortal to your feet. I am going to the world's end to visit Oceanus, from whom all we gods proceed, and Mother Tethys, they received me in their house, took care of me and brought me up, having taken me over from Rhea, when Jove imprisoned great Saturn into the depths that are under earth and sea. I must go and see them, that I may make peace between them. They have been quarreling, and are so angry that they have not slept with one another this long while. If I can bring them round and restore them to one another's embraces, they will be grateful to me and love me forever afterwards. Thereon, laughter-loving Venus said, I cannot and must not refuse you, for you sleep in the arms of Jove, who is our king. As she spoke, she loosed from her bosom the curiously embroidered girdle in which all her charms had been wrought, love, desire, and that sweet flattery which steals the judgment even of the most prudent. She gave the girdle to Juno and said, Take this girdle, wherein all my charms reside, and lay it in your bosom. If you will wear it, I promise you that your errand, be it what it may, will not be bootless. When she heard this, Juno smiled, and still smiling, she laid the girdle in her bosom. Venus now went back into the house of Jove, while Juno darted down from the summits of Olympus. She passed over Pyria and fair Emathia, and went on and on, till she came to the snowy ranges of the Thracian horsemen, over whose topmost crest she sped without ever setting foot to the ground. When she came to Athos, she went on over the waves of the sea, till she reached Limnos, the city of, city of noble Thoas. There she met Sleep, own brother to death, and caught him by the hand, saying, Sleep, you who lorded alike over mortals and immortals, if you ever did me a service in times past, do one for me now, and I shall be grateful to you ever after. Close Jove's keen eyes for me in slumber, while I hold him clasped in my embrace, and I will give you a beautiful golden seat that can never fall to pieces. My club-footed son Vulcan can make it for you and he shall give it a footstool 
for you to rest your fair feet upon when you were at table. Then sleep answered, Juno, great queen of goddesses, daughter of Madi, Saturn, I would lull any other of the gods to sleep without compunction, not even accepting the waters of Oceanus, from whom all of them proceed. But I dare not go near Jove, nor send him to sleep unless he bids me. I have had one lesson already through doing what you asked me, on the day when Jove's mighty son Hercules set sail from Ilias, after having sacked the city of the Trojans. At your bidding, I suffused my sweet self over the mind of Aegis-bearing Jove, and laid him to rest. Meanwhile, you hatched a plot against Hercules, and set the blast of the angry winds beating upon the sea, till you took him to the godly city of Kos, away from all his friends. Jove was furious when he awoke, and began hurling the gods about all over the house. He was looking more particularly for myself, and would have flung me down through space into the sea, where I should never have been heard of any more, had not night, who cows both men and gods, protected me. I fled to her, and Jove left off looking for me in spite of his being so angry, for he did not dare do anything to displease night. And now you are again asking me to do something on which I cannot venture. And Juno said, Sleep. Why do you take such notions as those into your head? Do you think Jove will be as anxious to help the Trojans as he was about his own son? Come, I will marry you to one of the youngest of the graces, and she shall be your own. Pasithea, whom you have always wanted to marry. Sleep was pleased when he heard this, and answered, Then swear it to me by the dread waters of the river Styx. Lay one hand on the bounteous earth, and the other on the sheen of the sea, so that all the gods who dwell down below with Saturn may be our witnesses, and see that you really do give me one of the youngest of the graces, Pasithea, whom I have always wanted to marry. Juno did as he had said. She swore and invoked all the gods of the netherworld, who are called Titans, to witness. When she had completed her oath, the two enshrouded themselves in a thick mist and sped lightly forward, leaving Limnos and Embrus behind them. Presently they reached many fountain Ida, mother of wild beasts, and Lectum, where they left the sea to go on by land, and the tops of the trees of the forest soughed under the going of their feet. Here sleep halted, and ere Jove caught sight of him, he climbed a lofty pine tree, the tallest that reared its head toward heaven on all Ida. He hid himself behind the branches, and sat there in the semblance of the sweet-singing bird that haunts the mountains, and is called Chalcis by the gods, but men call it Simendus. Juno then went to Gargaras, the topmost peak of Ida, and Jove, driver of the clouds, set eyes upon her. As soon as he did so, he became inflamed with the same passionate desire for her that he had felt when they had first enjoyed each other's embraces and slept with one another without their dear parents knowing anything about it. He went up to her and said, What do you want that you have come hither from Olympus? and that too with neither chariot nor horses to convey you. Then Juno told him a lying tale, and said, I am going to the world's end, to visit Oceanus, from whom all we gods proceed, and Mother Tethys. They received me into their house, took care of me, and brought me up. I must go and see them, that I may make peace between them. They have been quarreling, and are so angry, that they have not slept with one another this long time. The horses that will take me over land and sea are stationed on the lowermost spurs of many fountain Ida, and I have come here from Olympus on purpose to consult you. I was afraid that you might be angry with me later on if I went to the house of Oceanus without letting you know. 
And Jove said, Juno, you can choose some other time for paying your visit to Oceanus. For the present, let us devote ourselves to love and to the enjoyment of one another. Never yet have I been so overpowered by passion, neither for goddess nor mortal woman, as I am at this moment for yourself. Not even when I was in love with the wife of Ixion, who bore me Perithus, peer of gods in council, nor yet with Danae, the daintily ankled daughter of Acrius, who bore me the famed hero Perseus. Then there was the daughter of Phoenix, who bore me Minos, and Redamanthus. Uh, there was Semele, and Alcmena, and Thebes, by whom I begot my lion-hearted son Hercules, while Semele became mother to Bacchus, the comforter of mankind. There was Queen Ceres again, and lovely Leto, and yourself, but with none of these was I ever so much enamored as I now am with you. Juno again answered him with a lying tale. Most dread son of Saturn, she exclaimed, what are you talking about? Would you have us enjoy one another here on the top of Mount Ida, where everything can be seen? What if one of the ever-living gods should see us sleeping together and tell the others? It would be such a scandal that when I had risen from your embraces, I could never show myself inside your house again. But, if you are so minded, there is a room which your son Vulcan has made me, and he has given it good strong doors. If you would so have it, let us go thither and lie down. And Jove answered, Juno, you need not be afraid that either God or man will see you, for I will enshroud both of us in such a dense golden cloud that the very sun, for all his bright piercing beams, shall not see through it. With this the son of Saturn caught his wife in his embrace, where on the earth sprouted them a cushion of young grass, with dew bespangled lotus, crocus, and hyacinth, so soft and thick, they raised them well above the ground. Here they laid themselves down, and overhead they were covered by a fair cloud of gold, from which there fell glittering dewdrops. Thus, then, did the sire of all things repose peacefully on the crest of Ida, overcome at once by sleep and love, and he held his spouse in his arms. Meanwhile, sleep made off to the ships of the Achaeans, to tell earth encircling Neptune, lord of the earthquake. When he had found him, he said, Now, Neptune, you can help the Danaeans with a will, and give them victory, though it be only for a short time while Jove is still sleeping. I have sent him into a sweet slumber, and Juno has beguiled him into going to bed with her. Sleep now departed, and went his ways to and fro among mankind, leaving Neptune more eager than ever to help the Danians. He darted forward among the first ranks and shouted, saying, Argives, shall we let Hector, son of Priam, have the triumph of taking our ships and covering himself with glory? This is what he says that he shall now do, seeing that Achilles is still in dungeon at his ships. We shall get on very well without him if we keep each other in heart and stand by one another. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say. Let us each take the best and largest shield we can lay hold of, put on our helmets, and sally forth with our longest spears in our hands. I will lead you on, and Hector, son of Priam, rage as he may, will not dare to hold out against us. If any good staunch soldier has only a small shield, let him hand it over to a worse man, and take a larger one for himself. Thus did he speak, and they did even as he had said. The son of Tegeus, Ulysses, and Agamemnon, wounded though they were, set the others in array and went about everywhere, affecting the exchanges of armor. The most valiant took the best armor and gave the worst to the worst men. When they had donned their bronze armor, they marched on with Neptune at their head. In his strong hand he grasped his terrible sword, keen of edge and flashing like lightning. Woe to him who comes across it in the day of battle. All men quake for fear and keep away from it. 
Hector, on the other side, set the Trojans in array. Thereon, Neptune and Hector waged fierce war on one another. Hector on the Trojan, and Neptune on the Argive side. Mighty was the uproar as the two forces meet. The sea came rolling in toward the ships and tents of the Achaeans, but waves do not thunder on the shore more loudly when driven before the blast of Boreas, nor do the flames of a fat forest fire roar more fiercely when it is well alight upon the mountains, nor does the wind bellow with ruder music as it tears on through the tops of when it is blowing its hardest than the terrible shout which the Trojans and Achaeans raised as they sprang upon one another. Hector first aimed his spear at Ajax, who was turned full towards him, nor did he miss his aim. The spear struck him, where two bands passed over his chest, the band of his shield and that of his silver-studded sword, and these protected his body. Hector was angry that his spear should have been hurled in vain, and withdrew under cover of his men. As he was thus retreating, Ajax, son of Telamon, struck him with a stone, of which there were many lying about under the men's feet as they fought, brought there to give support to the ship's sides as they lay on the shore. Ajax caught up one of them, and struck Hector above the rim of his shield, close to his neck. The blow made him spin round like a top and reel in all directions. As an oak falls headlong, when uprooted by the lightning flash of Father Jove, and there's a terrible smell of brimstone, no man can help being dismayed if he's standing near it, for a thunderbolt is a very awful thing. Even so did Hector fall to earth and bite the dust. His spear fell from his hand, but his shield and helmet were made fast about his body, and his bronze armor rang about him. The sons of the Achaeans came running with a loud cry towards him, hoping to drag him away, and they showered their darts on the Trojans. But none of them could wound him before he was surrounded and covered by the princes Polydamus, Aeneas, Agenor, Sarpedon, captain of the Lycians, and noble Glaucus. Of the others, too, there was not one who was unmindful of him, and they held their round shields over him to cover him. His comrades then lifted him off the ground and bore him away from the battle to the place where his horses stood waiting for him at the rear of the fight with their driver and the chariot. These then took him towards the city, groaning and in great pain. When they reached the ford of the fair stream of Xanthus, begotten of immortal Jove. They took him from off his chariot and laid him down on the ground. They poured water over him, and as they did so he breathed again and opened his eyes. Then kneeling on his knees he vomited blood, but soon fell back onto the ground, and his eyes were again closed in darkness, for he was still stunned by the blow. When the Argives saw Hector leaving the field, they took heart and set upon the Trojans yet more furiously. Ajax, fleet son of Oelius, began by springing on Satnius, son of Enops, and wounding him with his spear. A fair naiad nymph had borne him to Enops, as he was herding cattle by the banks of the river Satnios. The son of Oelius came up to him and struck him in the flank so that he fell and a fierce fight between Trojans and Danians raged round the body. Polydamus, son of Panthus, drew near to avenge him, and wounded Prothenior, son of Arelychus, on the right shoulder. The terrible spear went right through his shoulder, and he clutched the earth as he fell in the dust. Polydamus vaunted loudly over him, saying, Again, I take it that the spear has not sped in vain from the strong hand of the son of Panthus. An Argive has caught it in his body, and I will serve him for a staff as he goes down into the house of Hades. The Argives were maddened by this boasting. Ajax, son of Telamon, was more angry than any, for the man had fallen close beside him. So he aimed at Polydamus as he was retreating, but Polydamus saved himself by swerving aside and the spear struck 
Archilochus, son of Antenor, for heaven counseled his destruction. It struck him where the head springs from the neck of the top joint of the spine, and severed both the tendons at the back of the head. His head, mouth, and nostrils reached the ground long before his legs and knees could do so. And Ajax shouted to Polydamas, saying, Think, Polydamas, and tell me truly whether this man is not as well worth killing as Prothenior was. He seems rich, and of rich family. A brother it may be, or son of the knight Antenor, for he is very like him. But he knew well who it was, and the Trojans were greatly angered. Acamas then bestrode his brother's body and wounded Promachus, the Boatian, with his spear, for he was trying to drag his brother's body away. Acamas vaunted loudly over him, saying, Argive archers, braggarts that you are, toil and suffering shall not be for us only, but some of you too shall fall here as well as ourselves. See how Promachus now sleeps, vanquished by my spear? Payment for my brother's blood has not been long delayed. A man, therefore, may well be thankful if he leaves a kinsman in his house behind him to avenge his fall. His taunts and fury to the Argives, and Penelius was more enraged than any of them. He sprang toward Acamas, but Acamas did not stand his ground, and he killed Ilionius, son of the rich flockmaster Forbus, whom Mercury had favored and endowed with greater wealth than any other of the Trojans. Ilionius was his only son, and Penelius now wounded him in the eye under his eyebrows, tearing the eyeball from its socket. The spear went right through the eye, into the nape of the neck, and he fell, stretching out both hands before him. Penelius then drew his sword and smote him on the neck, so that both head and helmet came tumbling down to the ground, with the spear still sticking in the eye. He then held up the head as though it had been a poppy head and showed it to the Trojans, vaunting over them as he did so. Trojans, he cried, bid the father and mother of noble Ilionius make moan for him in their house, for the wife also of Promachus, son of Aliginor, will never be gladdened by the coming of her dear husband when we Argives return with our ships from Troy. As he spoke, fear fell upon them, and every man looked round about to see whither he might fly for safety. Tell me now, O muses that dwell on Olympus, who was the first of the Argives to bear away blood-stained spoils after Neptune, lord of the earthquake, had turned the fortune of war? Ajax, son of Telamon, was first to win Hertius, son of Gyrtius, captain of the staunch Mysians. Antilochus killed Phalces and Murmurus, while Meriones slew Mores and Hippotion. Teusur also killed Prothoon and Peribetes. The son of Atreus then wounded Hyperenor, shepherd of his people, in the flank, and the bronze point made his entrails gush out as it tore in among them. On this his life came hurrying out of him at the place where he had been wounded, and his eyes were closed in darkness. Ajax, son of Oelius, killed more than any other, for there was no man so fleet as he to pursue flying foes when Jove had spread panic among them. End of Book 14 The Iliad by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler Book 15 Recording by Kevin Laverne Jove Awakes tells Apollo to heal Hector, and the Trojans again become victorious. But when their flight had taken them past the trench and the set stakes, and many had fallen by the hands of the Danans, the Trojans made a halt on reaching their chariots, routed and pale with fear. Jove now woke on the crests of Ida, where he was lying with golden-throned Juno by his side, and starting to his feet he saw the Trojans and the Achaeans, 
the one thrown into confusion, and the others driving them pell-mell before them with King Neptune in their midst. He saw Hector lying on the ground, with his comrades gathered round him, gasping for breath, wandering in mind and vomiting blood, for it was not the feeblest of the Achaeans who struck him. The sire of gods and men had pity on him, and looked fiercely on Juno. "'I see, Juno,' said he, "'you mischief-making trickster, that your cunning has stayed Hector from fighting, and has caused the rout of his host. I am in half a mind to thrash you, in which case you will be the first to reap the fruits of your scurvy knavery. Do you not remember how once upon a time I had you hanged?' I fastened two anvils onto your feet, and bound your hands in a chain of gold which none might break, and you hung in mid-air among the clouds. All the gods in Olympus were in a fury, but they could not reach you to set you free. When I caught any one of them, I gripped him and hurled him from the heavenly threshold, till he came fainting down to earth. Yet even this did not relieve my mind, from the incessant anxiety which I felt about noble Hercules, whom you and Boreas had spitefully conveyed beyond the sea to cause, after suborning the tempests. But I rescued him, and notwithstanding all his mighty labors I brought him back again to Argos. I would remind you of this, that you may learn to leave off being so deceitful, and discover how much you are likely to gain by the embraces out of which you have come here to trick me. Juno trembled as he spoke, and said, May heaven above and earth below be my witnesses, with the waters of the river Styx, and this is the most solemn oath that a blessed God can take, Nay, I swear also by your own almighty head, and by our bridal bed, things over which I could never possibly perjure myself, that Neptune is not punishing Hector and the Trojans and helping the Achaeans through any doing of mine. It is all of his own mere motion, because he was sorry to see the Achaeans hard-pressed at their ships. If I were advising him, I should tell him to do as you bid him. The sire of gods and men smiled and answered, If you, Juno, were always to support me when we sit in council of the gods, Neptune, like it or no, would soon come round to your and my way of thinking. If then you are speaking the truth, and mean what you say, go among the rank and file of the gods, and tell Iris and Apollo, lord of the bow, that I want them. Iris, that she may go to the Achaean host, and tell Neptune to leave off fighting and go home, and Apollo, that he may send Hector again into battle, and give him fresh strength. He will thus forget his present sufferings, and drive the Achaeans back in confusion, till they fall among the ships of Achilles, son of Peleus. Achilles will then send his comrade Patroclus into battle, and Hector will kill him in front of Ilius, after he has slain many warriors, and among them my own noble son Sarpedon. Achilles will kill Hector to avenge Patroclus, and from that time I will bring it about that the Achaeans shall persistently drive the Trojans back till they fulfill the counsels of Minerva and take Ilius. But I will not stay my anger, nor permit any god to help the Danans, till I have accomplished the desire of the son of Peleus, according to the promise I made, by bowing my head on the day when Thetis touched my knees and besought me to give him honor. Juno heeded his words, and went from the heights of Ida to great Olympus. Swift as the thought of one whose fancy carries him over vast continents, and he says to himself, Now I will be here or there, and he would have all manner of things, even so swiftly did Juno wing her way till she came to high Olympus, and went in among the gods who were gathered in the house of Jove. 
When they saw her, they all of them came up to her and held out their cups to her by way of greeting. She let the others be, but took the cup offered her by lovely Themis, who was first to come running up to her. Juno, said she, why are you here? And you seem troubled. Has your husband, the son of Saturn, been frightening you? And Juno answered, Themis, do not ask me about it. You know what a proud and cruel disposition my husband has. Lead the gods to table, where you and all the immortals can hear the wicked designs which he has avowed. Many a one, mortal and immortal, will be angered by them, however peaceably he may be feasting now. On this Juno sat down, and the gods were troubled throughout the house of Jove. Laughter sat on her lips, but her brow was furrowed with care, and she spoke up in a rage. "'Fools that we are,' she cried, "'to be thus madly angry with Jove. We keep on wanting to go up to him and stay him by force or by persuasion, but he sits aloof and cares for nobody, for he knows that he is much stronger than any other of the immortals. Make the best, therefore, of whatever ills he may choose to send each one of you, Mars, I take it, has had a taste of them already, for his son Ascalaphus has fallen in battle, the man whom of all others he loved most dearly, and whose father he owns himself to be. When he heard this, Mars smote his two sturdy thighs with the flat of his hands, and said in anger, Do not blame me, you gods that dwell in heaven, if I go to the ships of the Achaeans and avenge the death of my son, even though it end in my being struck by Jove's lightning and lying in blood and dust among the corpses. And as he spoke, he gave orders to yoke his horses panic and rout, while he put on his armor. On this, Jove would have been roused to still more fierce and implacable enmity against the other immortals, had not Minerva, alarmed for the safety of the gods, sprung from her seat and hurried outside. She tore the helmet from his head and the shield from his shoulders, and she took the bronze spear from his strong hand and set it on one side. Then she said to Mars, Madman, you are undone. You have ears that hear not, or you have lost all judgment and understanding. Have you not heard what Juno has said on coming straight from the presence of Olympian Jove? Do you wish to go through all kinds of suffering before you are brought back sick and sorry to Olympus, after having caused infinite mischief to all us others? Jove would instantly leave the Trojans and Achaeans to themselves. He would come to Olympus and punish us, and would grip us up one after another, guilty or not guilty. Therefore lay aside your anger for the death of your son. Better men than he have either been killed already, or will fall hereafter, and one cannot protect every one's whole family. With these words she took Mars back to his seat. Meanwhile Juno called Apollo outside, with Iris the messenger of the gods. Jove, she said to them, desires you to go to him at once on Mount Ida. When you have seen him, you are to do as he may then bid you. Thereon Juno left them and resumed her seat inside, while Iris and Apollo made all haste on their way. When they reached many-fountained Ida, mother of wild beasts, they found Jove seated on topmost Gargarus, with a fragrant cloud encircling his head as with a diadem. They stood before his presence, and he was pleased with them for having been so quick in obeying the orders his wife had given them. He spoke to Iris first. Go, said he, fleet Iris, tell King Neptune what I now bid you, and tell him true. Bid him leave off fighting, and either join the company of the gods, or go down into the sea. If he takes no heed and disobeys me, let him consider well whether he is strong enough to hold his own against me if I attack him. I am older and much stronger than he is. Yet he is not afraid to set himself up as on a level with myself, of whom all the other gods stand in awe. Iris, fleet as the wind, obeyed him, 
and as the cold hail or snowflakes that fly from out the clouds before the blast of Boreas, even so did she wing her way till she came close up to the great shaker of the earth. Then she said, I have come, O dark-haired king that holds the world in his embrace, to bring you a message from Jove. He bids you leave off fighting, and either join the company of the gods, or go down into the sea. If, however, you take no heed and disobey him, he says he will come down here and fight you. He would have you keep out of his reach, for he is older and much stronger than you are, and yet you are not afraid to set yourself up as on a level with himself, of whom all the other gods stand in awe. Neptune was very angry and said, Great heavens! Strong as Jove may be, he has said more than he can do if he has threatened violence against me, who am of like honor with himself. We were three brothers whom Rhea bore to Saturn, Jove, myself, and Hades, who rules the world below. Heaven and earth were divided into three parts, and each of us was to have an equal share. When we cast lots, it fell to me to have my dwelling in the sea for evermore. Hades took the darkness of the realms under the earth, while air and sky and clouds were the portion that fell to Jove. But earth and great Olympus are the common property of all. Therefore I will not walk as Jove would have me. For all his strength, let him keep to his own third share, and be contented without threatening to lay hands upon me as though I were nobody. Let him keep his bragging talk for his own sons and daughters, who must perforce obey him. Iris, fleet as the wind, then answered, Am I really, Neptune, to take this daring and unyielding message to Jove, or will you reconsider your answer? Sensible people are open to argument, and you know that the Arrhenes always range themselves on the side of the older person. Neptune answered, Goddess Iris, your words have been spoken in season. It is well when a messenger shows so much discretion. Nevertheless, it cuts me to the very heart that any one should rebuke so angrily another who is his own peer, and of like empire with himself. Now, however, I will give way in spite of my displeasure. Furthermore, let me tell you, and I mean what I say, if contrary to the desire of myself, Minerva, driver of the spoil, Juno, Mercury, and King Vulcan, Jove spares steep Ilius, and will not let the Achaeans have the great triumph of sacking it, let him understand that he will incur our implacable resentment. Neptune now left the field to go down under the sea and sorely did the Achaeans miss him. Then Jove said to Apollo, Go, dear Phoebus, to Hector, for Neptune, who holds the earth in his embrace, has now gone down under the sea to avoid the severity of my displeasure. Had he not done so, those gods who are below with Saturn would have come to hear of the fight between us. It is better for both of us that he should have curbed his anger and kept out of my reach, for I should have much trouble with him. Take then your tasseled aegis, and shake it furiously, so as to set the Achaean heroes in a panic. Take moreover brave Hector, O far-darter, into your own care, and rouse him to deeds of daring, till the Achaeans are sent flying back to their ships and to the Hellespont. From that point I will think it well over, how the Achaeans may have a respite from their troubles. Apollo obeyed his father's saying, and left the crests of Ida, flying like a falcon, bane of doves, and swiftest of all birds. He found Hector no longer lying upon the ground, but sitting up, for he had just come to himself again. He knew those who were about him, and the sweat and hard breathing had left him from the moment when the will of Aegis-bearing Jove had revived him. Apollo stood beside him and said, Hector, son of Priam, why are you so faint, and why are you here away from the others? 
Has any mishap befallen you? Hector, in a weak voice, answered, And which kind sir of the gods are you, who now ask me thus? Do you not know that Ajax struck me on the chest with a stone as I was killing his comrades at the ships of the Achaeans, and compelled me to leave off fighting? I made sure that this very day I should breathe my last and go down into the house of Hades. Then King Apollo said to him, Take heart, the son of Saturn has sent you a mighty helper from Ida to stand by you and defend you, even me, Phoebus Apollo of the Golden Sword, who have been guardian hitherto not only of yourself but of your city. Now therefore order your horsemen to drive their chariots to the ships in great multitudes. I will go before your horses to smooth the way for them, and will turn the Achaeans in flight. As he spoke, he infused great strength into the shepherd of his people, and as a horse, stabled and full-fed, breaks loose and gallops gloriously over the plain to the place where he is wont to take his bath in the river, he tosses his head and his mane streams over his shoulders, as in all the pride of his strength he flies full speed to the pastures where the mares are feeding. Even so Hector, when he heard what the gods said, urged his horsemen on, and sped forward as fast as his limbs could take him. As country peasants set their hounds on to a homed stag or wild goat, he has taken shelter under rock or thicket, and they cannot find him, but, lo, a bearded lion whom their shouts have roused stands in their path, and they are in no further humor for the chase. Even so, the Achaeans were still charging on in a body, using their swords and spears pointed at both ends. But when they saw Hector going about among his men, they were afraid, and their hearts fell down into their feet. Then spoke Thoaz, son of Andraemon, leader of the Aetolians, a man who could throw a good throw, and who was staunch also in close fight, while few could surpass him in debate when opinions were divided. He then, with all sincerity and good will, addressed them thus, What in heaven's name do I see now? Is it not Hector come to life again? Every one made sure he had been killed by Ajax, son of Telamon, but it seems that one of the gods has again rescued him. He has killed many of us Danans already, and I take it will yet do so, for the hand of Jove must be with him, or he would never dare show himself so masterful in the forefront of the battle. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say. Let us order the main body of our forces to fall back upon the ships, but let those of us who profess to be the flower of the army stand firm, and see whether we cannot hold Hector back at the point of our spears as soon as he comes near us. I conceive that he will then think better of it before he tries to charge into the press of the Danans. Thus did he speak, and they did even as he said. Those who were about Ajax and King Idomeneus, the followers, moreover, of Teucer, Meriones, and Meges, peer of Mars, called all their best men about them, and sustained the fight against Hector and the Trojans. But the main body fell back upon the ships of the Achaeans. The Trojans pressed forward in a dense body, with Hector striding on at their head. Before him went Phoebus Apollo, shrouded in cloud about his shoulders. He bore aloft the terrible Aegis, with its shaggy fringe, which Vulcan the smith had given Jove to strike terror into the hearts of men. With this in his hand he led on the Trojans. The Argives held together and stood their ground. The cry of battle rose high from either side, and the arrows flew from the bowstrings. Many a spear sped from strong hands and fastened in the bodies of many a valiant warrior, while others fell to earth midway, before they could taste of a man's fair flesh and glut themselves with blood. 
So long as Phoebus Apollo held his aegis quietly and without shaking it, the weapons on either side took effect and the people fell. But when he shook it straight in the face of the Danans and raised his mighty battle cry, their hearts fainted within them and they forgot their former prowess. As when two wild beasts spring in the dead of night on a herd of cattle or a large flock of sheep when the herdsman is not there, even so were the Danans struck helpless, for Apollo filled them with panic and gave victory to Hector and the Trojans. The fight then became more scattered, and they killed one another where they best could. Hector killed Stichius and Arcesilaus, the one leader of the Boeotians, and the other friend and comrade of Menestheus. Aeneas killed Medon and Iasus. The first was bastard son to Oelius and brother to Ajax, but he lived in Phileus, away from his own country, for he had killed a man, a kinsman of his stepmother, Areopus, whom Oelius had married. Iasus had become a leader of the Athenians, and was son of Sphelus, the son of Bucolos. Polydamus killed Mechistius, and Polites Echius in the front of the battle, while Agenor slew Clonius. Paris struck Diochus from behind in the lower part of the shoulder, as he was flying among the foremost, and the point of the spear went clean through him. While they were spoiling these heroes of their armor, the Achaeans were flying pell-mell to the trench and the set stakes, and were forced back within their wall. Hector then cried out to the Trojans, Forward to the ships, and let the spoils be. If I see any man keeping back on the other side of the wall, away from the ships, I will have him killed. His kinsmen and kinswomen shall not give him his dues of fire, but dogs shall tear him in pieces in front of our city. As he spoke, he laid his whip about his horse's shoulders and called to the Trojans throughout their ranks. The Trojans shouted with a cry that rent the air and kept their horses neck and neck with his own. Phoebus Apollo went before and kicked down the banks of the deep trench into its middle so as to make a great broad bridge, as broad as the throw of a spear when a man is trying his strength. The Trojan battalions poured over the bridge, and Apollo with his redoubtable aegis led the way. He kicked down the wall of the Achaeans as easily as a child who, playing on the seashore, has built a house of sand, and then kicks it down again, and destroys it. Even so did you, O Apollo, shed toil and trouble upon the Argives, filling them with panic and confusion. Thus then were the Achaeans hemmed in at their ships, calling out to one another, and raising their hands with loud cries every man to heaven. Nestor of Gorini, tower of strength to the Achaeans, lifted up his hands to the starry firmament of heaven, and prayed more fervently than any of them. Father Jove, said he, if ever any one in wheat-growing Argos burned you fat thigh-bones of sheep or heifer, and prayed that he might return safely home, whereon you bowed your head to him in assent, bear it in mind now, and suffer not the Trojans to triumph thus over the Achaeans. All counseling Jove thundered loudly in answer to the prayer of the aged son of Nellius. When they heard Jove thunder, they flung themselves yet more fiercely on the Achaeans. As a wave breaking over the bulwarks of a ship when the sea runs high before a gale, for it is the force of the wind that makes the waves so great, even so did the Trojans spring over the wall with a shout, and drive their chariots onwards. The two sides fought with their double-pointed spears in hand-to-hand -hand encounter, the Trojans from their chariots, and the Achaeans climbing up into their ships and wielding the long pikes that were lying on the decks, ready for use in a sea-fight, jointed and shod with bronze. Now Patroclus, so long as the Achaeans and Trojans were fighting about the wall, 
but were not yet within it and at the ships, remained sitting in the tent of good Eurypylus, entertaining him with his conversation, and spreading herbs over his wound to ease his pain. When, however, he saw the Trojans swarming through the breach in the wall, while the Achaeans were clamoring and struck with panic, he cried aloud, and smote his two thighs with the flat of his hands. Eurypylus, he said in his dismay, I know you want me badly, but I cannot stay with you any longer, for there is hard fighting going on. A servant shall take care of you now, for I must make all speed to Achilles, and induce him to fight if I can. Who knows, but with heaven's help I may persuade him. A man does well to listen to the advice of a friend. When he had thus spoken, he went his way. The Achaeans stood firm and resisted the attack of the Trojans. Yet, though these were fewer in number, they could not drive them back from the ships. Neither could the Trojans break the Achaean ranks and make their way in among the tents and ships. As a carpenter's line gives a true edge to a piece of ship's timber, in the hand of some skilled workman whom Minerva has instructed in all kinds of useful arts, even so level was the issue of the fight between the two sides, as they fought some round one and some round another. Hector made straight for Ajax, and the two fought fiercely about the same ship. Hector could not force Ajax back and fire the ship, nor yet could Ajax drive Hector from the spot to which heaven had brought him. Then Ajax struck Calator, son of Clytius, in the chest with a spear as he was bringing fire towards the ship. He fell heavily to the ground, and the torch dropped from his hand. When Hector saw his cousin fallen in front of the ship, he shouted to the Trojans and Lycians, saying, Trojans, Lycians, and Dardanians, good in close fight, bait not a jot, but rescue the son of Clytius, lest the Achaeans strip him of his armor now that he is fallen. He then aimed a spear at Ajax, and missed him. But he hit Lycophron, a follower of Ajax, who came from Cythera, but was living with Ajax inasmuch as he had killed a man among the Cytherians. Hector's spear struck him on the head below the ear, and he fell headlong from the ship's prow on to the ground with no life left in him. Ajax shook with rage and said to his brother, Tell, sir, my good fellow, our trusty comrade, the son of Mastor, had fallen. He came to live with us from Cythera, and whom we honored as much as our own parents. Hector has just killed him. Fetch your deadly arrows at once, and the bow with which Phoebus Apollo gave you. Tell, sir, heard him, and hastened towards him with his bow and quiver in his hands. Forthwith he showered his arrows on the Trojans and hit Cletus, the son of Pisenor, comrade of Polydamus, the noble son of Penthaus, with the reins in his hands as he was attending to his horses. He was in the middle of the very thickest part of the fight, doing good service to Hector and the Trojans, but evil had now come upon him, and not one of those who were fain to do so could avert it, for the arrow struck him on the back of the neck, he fell from his chariot, and his horses shook the empty car as they swerved aside. King Polydamus saw what had happened, and was the first to come upon the horses. He gave them in charge to Astinus, son of Proteion, and ordered him to look on, and to keep the horses near at hand. He then went back and took his place in the front ranks. Telser then aimed another arrow at Hector and there would have been no more fighting at the ships if he had hit him and killed him then and there. Jove, however, who kept watch over Hector, had his eyes on Telser, and deprived him of his triumph by breaking his bowstring for him just as he was drawing it and about to take his aim. On this the arrow went astray and the bow fell from his hands. Telser shook with anger and said to his brother, Alas, see how heaven thwarts us in all we do. It has broken my bowstring and snatched the bow from my hand, though I strung it the selfsame morning that it might serve me for many an arrow. Ajax, son of Telamon, answered, My good fellow, let your bow and your arrows be, 
for Jove has made them useless in order to spite the Danans. Take your spear, lay your shield upon your shoulder, and both fight the Trojans yourself, and urge others to do so. They may be successful for the moment, but if we fight as we ought, they will find it a hard matter to take the ships. Telser then took his bow and put it by in his tent. He hung a shield up four hides thick about his shoulders, and on his comely head he set his helmet well wrought with a crest of horsehair that nodded menacingly above it. He grasped his redoubtable bronze-shod spear, and forthwith he was by the side of Ajax. When Hector saw that Telser's bow was of no more use to him, he shouted out to the Trojans and Lycians, Trojans, Lycians, and Dardanians, good and close fight, be men, my friends, and show your mettle here at the ships, for I see the weapon of one of their chieftains made useless by the hand of Jove. It is easy to see when Jove is helping people and means to help them still further, or again when he is bringing them down and will do nothing for them. He is now on our side, and is going against the Argives. Therefore swarm round the ships and fight. If any of you is struck by spear or sword and loses his life, let him die. He dies with honor who dies fighting for his country, and he will leave his wife and children safe behind him, with his house and allotment unplundered, if only the Achaeans can be driven back to their own land, they and their ships. With these words he put heart and soul into them all. Ajax on the other side exhorted his comrades, saying, Shame on you, Argives! We are now utterly undone, unless we can save ourselves by driving the enemy from our ships. Do you think, if Hector takes them, that you will be able to get home by land? Can you not hear him cheering on his whole host to fire our fleet, and bidding them remember that they are not at a dance but in battle? Our only course is to fight them with might and main. We had better chance it, life or death, once for all, than fight long and without issue hemmed in at our ships by worse men than ourselves. With these words he put life and soul into them all. Hector then killed Scidius, son of Perimedes, leader of the Phocians, and Ajax killed Laodamus, captain of foot soldiers, and son to Antenor. Polydamus killed Otus of Selene, a comrade of the son of Phileus, and chief of the proud Epians. When Meges saw this, he sprang upon him, but Polydamus crouched down, and he missed him, for Apollo would not suffer the son of Panthaus to fall in battle, but the spear hit Croesmus in the middle of his chest, whereon he fell heavily to the ground, and Meges stripped him of his armor. At that moment the valiant soldier Dolops, son of Lampus, sprang upon Lampus, was son of Laomedon, and for his valor, while his son Dolops was versed in all the ways of war. He then struck the middle of the son of Phileus' shield with his spear, setting on him at close quarters, but his good corslet made with plates of metal saved him. Phileus had brought it from Ephora and the river Seleus, where his host, King Euphates, had given it him to wear in battle and protect him. It now served to save the life of his son. Then Meges struck the topmost crest of Dolops' bronze helmet with his spear and tore away its plume of horsehair, so that all newly dyed with scarlet as it was, it tumbled down into the dust. While he was still fighting and confident of victory, Menelaus came up to help Meges, and got by the side of Dolops unperceived. He then speared him in the shoulder, from behind, and the point driven so furiously went through into his chest, whereon he fell headlong. The two then made towards him to strip him of his armor, but Hector called on all his brothers for help, and he especially upbraided brave Melanippus, son of Hicetaon, who erewhile used to pasture his herds of cattle in Percote, before the war broke out. But when the ships of the Danans came, he went back to Ilius, where he was eminent among the Trojans, 
and lived near Priam, who treated him as one of his own sons. Hector now rebuked him and said, Why, Melanippus, are you we thus remiss? Do you take no note of the death of your kinsmen, and do you not see how they are trying to take Dolops's armor? Follow me. There must be no fighting the Argives from a distance now, but we must do so in close combat till either we kill them or they take the high wall of Ilias and slay her people. He led on as he spoke, and the hero Melanippus followed after. Meanwhile Ajax, son of Telamon, was cheering on the Argives. My friends, he cried, be men, and fear dishonor. Quit yourselves in battle, so as to win respect from one another. Men who respect each other's good opinion are less likely to be killed than those who do not, but in flight there is neither gain nor glory. Thus did he exhort men who were already bent upon driving back the Trojans. They laid his words to heart, and hedged the ships as with a wall of bronze, while Jove urged on the Trojans. Menelaus of the loud battle cry urged Antilochus on. Antilochus, said he, you are young, and there is none of the Achaeans more fleet of foot or more valiant than you are. See if you cannot spring upon some Trojan and kill him. He hurried away when he had thus spurred Antilochus, who at once darted out from the front ranks and aimed a spear after looking carefully round him. The Trojans fell back as he threw, and the dart did not speed from his hand without effect, for it struck Melanippus, the proud son of Hicetaon, in the breast by the nipple as he was coming forward, and his armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. Antilochus sprang upon him as a dog springs on a fawn which a hunter has hit, as it was breaking away from its covert, and killed it. Even so, O Melanippus, did stalwart Antilochus spring upon you to strip you of your armor. But noble Hector marked him, and came running up to him through the thick of the battle. Antilochus, brave soldier though he was, would not stay to face him, but fled like some savage creature which knows it has done wrong, and flies when it has killed a dog or a man who is hurting his cattle, before a body of men can be gathered to attack it. Even so did the son of Nestor fly, and the Trojans and Hector with a cry that rent the air showered their weapons after him, nor did he turn round and stay his flight till he had reached his comrades. The Trojans, fierce as lions, were still rushing on towards the ships in fulfillment of the behests of Jove, who kept spurring them on to new deeds of daring, while he deadened the courage of the Argives, and defeated them by encouraging the Trojans. For he meant giving glory to Hector, son of Priam, and letting him throw fire upon the ships, till he had fulfilled the unrighteous prayer that Thetis had made him. Jove, therefore, bided his time till he should see the glare of a blazing ship. From that hour he was about so to order that the Trojans should be driven back from the ships, and to vouchsafe glory to the Achaeans. With this purpose he inspired Hector, son of Priam, who was cager enough already to assail the ships. His fury was as that of Mars, or as when a fire is raging in the glades of some dense forest upon the mountains. He foamed at the mouth, his eyes glared under his terrible eyebrows, and his helmet quivered on his temples by reason of the fury with which he fought. Jove from heaven was with him, and though he was but one against many, vouchsafed him victory and glory. For he was doomed to an early death, and already Pallas Minerva was hurrying on the hour of his destruction at the hands of the son of Peleus. Now, however, he was trying to break the ranks of the enemy wherever he could see them thickest, and in the goodliest armor. But do what he might, he could not break through them, for they stood as a tower four-square, or as some high cliff rising from the gray sea that braves the anger of the gale, and of the waves that thunder up against it. He fell upon them like flames of fire from every quarter. 
as when a wave raised mountain high by wind and storm breaks over a ship and covers it deep in foam the fierce winds roar against the mast the hearts of the sailors fail them for fear and they are saved but by a very little from destruction even so were the hearts of the achaeans fainting within them or as a savage lion attacking a herd of cows while they are feeding by thousands in the low-lying meadows by some wide-watered shore the herdsman is at his wit's end how to protect his herd and keeps going about now in the van and now in the rear of his cattle while the lion springs into the thick of them and fastens on a cow so that they all tremble for fear even so were the achaeans utterly panic-stricken by hector and father jove nevertheless hector only killed periphetes of mycenae he was son of copreus who was wont to take the orders of king eurystheus to mighty hercules but the son was a far better man than the father in every way he was fleet of foot a valiant warrior and in understanding ranked among the foremost men of mycenae he it was who then afforded hector a triumph for as he was turning back he stumbled against the rim of his shield which reached his feet and served to keep the javelins off him he tripped against this and fell face upward his helmet ringing loudly about his head as he did so hector saw him fall and ran up to him he then thrust a spear into his chest and killed him close to his own comrades these for all their sorrow could not help him for they were themselves terribly afraid of hector they had now reached the ships and the prows of those that had been drawn up first were on every side of them but the trojans came pouring after them the argives were driven back from the first row of ships but they made a stand by their tents without being broken up and scattered shame and fear restrained them they kept shouting incessantly to one another and nestor of garini tower of strength to the achaeans was loudest in imploring every man by his parents and beseeching him to stand firm be men my friends he cried and respect one another's good opinion think all of you on your children your wives your property and your parents whether these be alive or dead on their behalf though they are not here i implore you to stand firm and not to turn in flight with these words he put heart and soul into them all minerva lifted the thick veil of darkness from their eyes and much light fell upon them alike on the side of the ships and on that where the fight was raging they could see hector and all his men both those in the rear who were taking no part in the battle and those who were fighting by the ships ajax could not bring himself to retreat along with the rest but strode from deck to deck with a great sea pike in his hands twelve cubits long and joined with rings as a man skilled in feats of horsemanship couples four horses together and comes tearing full speed along the public way from the country into some large town many both men and women marvel as they see him for he keeps all the time changing his horse springing from one to another without ever missing his feet while the horses are at a gallop even so did ajax go striding from one ship's deck to another and his voice went up into the heavens he kept on shouting his orders to the danans and exhorting them to defend their ships and tents neither did hector remain within the main body of the trojan warriors but as a dun eagle swoops down upon a flock of wild fowl feeding near a river geese it may be or cranes or long-necked swans even so did hector made straight for a dark proud ship rushing right towards it for jove with his mighty hand impelled him forward and roused his people to follow him and now the battle again raged furiously at the ships you would have thought the men were coming on fresh and unwearied so fiercely did they fight and this was the mind in which they were the achaeans did not believe they should escape destruction but thought themselves doomed while there was not a Trojan but his heart beat high with the hope of firing the ships and putting the Achaean heroes to the sword. 
Thus were the two sides minded. Then Hector seized the stern of the good ship that had brought Protesilaus to Troy, but never bore him back to his native land. Round this ship there raged a close hand-to-hand -hand fight between the Danaans and the Trojans. They did not fight at a distance with bows and javelins, but with one mind hacked at another in close combat with their mighty swords and spears pointed at both ends. They fought moreover with keen battle-axes and with hatchets. Many a good stout blade, hilted and scabbarded with iron, fell from hand or shoulder as they fought, and the earth ran red with blood. Hector, when he had seized the ship, would not loose his hold, but held on to its curved stern and shouted to the Trojans, Bring fire and raise the battle-cry, all of you with a single voice. Now has Jove vouchsafed us a day that will pay us for all the rest. This day we shall take the ships which came hither against heaven's will, and which have caused us such infinite suffering through the cowardice of our counsellors, who when I would have done battle at the ships held me back and forbade the host to follow me. If Jove did then indeed warp our judgments, himself now commands me and cheers me on. As he spoke thus, the Trojans sprang yet more fiercely on the Achaeans, and Ajax no longer held his ground, for he was overcome by the darts that were flung at him, and made sure that he was doomed. Therefore he left the raised deck at the stern, and stepped back on to the seven-foot bench of the oarsmen. Here he stood on the lookout, and with his spear held back Trojan, whom he saw bringing fire to the ships. All the time he kept on shouting at the top of his voice and exhorting the Danans. My friends, he cried, Danan heroes, servants of Mars, be men, my friends, and fight with might and with main. Can we hope to find helpers hereafter or a wall to shield us more surely than the one we have? There is no strong city within reach, whence we may draw fresh forces to turn the scales in our favor. We are on the plain of the armed Trojans with the sea behind us, and far from our own country. Our salvation, therefore, is in the might of our hands, and in hard fighting. As he spoke, he wielded his spear with still greater fury, and when any Trojan made towards the ships with fire at Hector's bidding, he would be on the lookout for him, and drive at him with his long spear. Twelve men did he thus kill in hand-to-hand -hand fight before the ships. End of Book 15